Yeah. Good evening. It's good to see all of you. Thank you for coming out. Why don't we stand and go to page 760? We're going to sing a couple choruses again tonight. 760 in your songbook, if you would all stand with me. Sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. We're, we're going to have to sing that one more time, that phrase... Um, and he's the one I'm waiting for. Probably the coming of Jesus Christ is the one thing that can make every day a little bit sweeter than the day before. Let's sing that song one more time. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Amen. I sure hope that's true in your life. 811. 811. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful, His name is wonderful, His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything, His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, he's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, almighty God is he, bow down before him, love and adore him, his name wonderful Jesus my Lord amen that's good singing you can be seated let's go ahead and get our ushers up here for our Wednesday night offering a couple announcements June 9th is the next soaring Eagles fellowship there will be a sign up sheep I think Sunday morning out at the welcome center and then VBS will be here before we know it, and maybe before we're ready for it. That happens once in a while. So if you would like to help and you haven't talked to Miss Janie, please do so ASAP. That's the only announcements I have to add. So let's pray. Mike, will you pray for the offering? song, isn't it? Since he rent the veil in two. Wow. All right. Kids, we'll see you in a little while. 
you had a project to do tonight. Some exciting stuff back there happening. Going to become professional puppeteers before the night's over, I think. All right. I'd like you all to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. If you would please, Matthew chapter 6. Um, I've been doing a lot of thinking about, about life, about um, navigating life. Um, if, you're, if you're a young person here, I'm talking about looking to your future and so on. I, uh, I guess this, there's a few of you here. I, I guess this message is really more towards the younger and maybe middle-aged folks and you older folks can can say amen or maybe you can get something out of it or maybe you can say that's not right whatever you want to do but um a couple of things that kind of got me thinking about this was um uh, the 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 world we live in is an anxious world have you have you noticed that there's a lot of anxiety um we're kind of weird creatures. You know, the, um, I was reading uh, Brant Hansen's book, um, Unoffendable, I think. And he mentions that, uh, that humans are weird in that we, we are afraid of things and we build our anxiety up over time. Uh, and he says, take a gazelle, for example. He said... A gazelle is standing there in the field and all of a sudden uh, a lion comes after him and the gazelle has this immediate fight or flight emotion, immediately stress, like max stress, and it takes off. Now, what's going to happen with a gazelle is it's either going to be eaten or it's going to get away, one of the two. He said humans are different than that. Humans are, um, we'll sit there and think, will the lion get us or won't the lion get us? And we'll think about it for days and days and days and days. And if the lion doesn't catch us, we think about how he could have caught us and what might have happened if he had have caught us. And we, the gazelle goes on and eats grass and forgets the lion. It's completely stress-free life. Uh, I thought about that. You know, the Bible says that the, the wicked fleeth when no man pursueth. Have you ever sat and stewed about, I wonder what they think about me. You ever sat and stewed about that? I wonder what someone's opinion is. Well, they said that. I wonder what they really meant. Yeah, we, we just sit there and stew and stew and stew over stupid stuff and get ourselves all worked up, end up with an ulcer, and uh, be more like the gazelle. No. <laughs> I got to thinking about that, and then there was another thing that, that kind of um, uh, drifted through my brain as I was uh, thinking about some you know, businessmen and things and some of the business ventures that my son and I are involved in right now in the Bible. The Bible says this, the love of money is the root of all evil. While well, some coveted after they've fallen, they've fallen many hurtful snares. Okay? Um, R.G. Letourneau. Uh, how many of you guys know who R.G. Letourneau is? Uh, a couple of you. R.G. Letourneau, there's a book written about him that says he moved heaven and earth. Uh, the reason was uh, Mr. Letourneau invented uh, uh, vehicles that are bigger than everybody else's. Um, I'm talking about gigantic vehicles. Um, there was a Facebook post somebody put up this evening that made me think of it. This gigantic, massive uh, truck, dump truck, and uh, it looks like this Dump truck's like this big, and a semi-truck is sitting beside it. It looks about this big. You're like, you can't even believe how big these things are. Uh, in the mines, some of Letourneau's uh, machines are actually like submarines with full galleys in them. And guys live in them. And as they dig down, coal, you know, digging for coal or, what, or whatever they're digging for, as, they, as they, those machines get deeper and deeper into the ground, finally they reach the point where they're finished, and nobody ever pulls the machine out because it's too big. There's nothing bigger than it. Uh, R. G. Laterno was a godly man, and he started out at the beginning of his career giving 10% of everything the company made to the Lord. 
It wasn't long, and he said to his wife, let's give 20%. And then he said, let's give 50%. And at the end of his life, he was given 90% of everything he made. The guy was a multimillionaire, built many Christian colleges. There's many Christian colleges around the, around the world that were built with R.G. Laternal money. Uh, I think he might have died in the 70s. I'm not sure uh, exactly how long. It's been you know, some of our lifetimes. I, I, I remember he was, he was uh, an old, older man when I was young. But um, what a great, uh, a great story and what a great uh, concept. I've, I've listened to stories about some of these entrepreneurs and then I look in the Bible and it says, don't get entangled with the affairs of this life. And then I read uh, about the soils and it says in the, in the soils, there's the soils where the plant grows up and it gets choked with the cares of this life and doesn't bring fruit. Then I read uh, verses like in 2 Timothy that says, uh, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Think about it. God wants you to live a good and quiet and peaceable life. So he says, pray for your ruler so that you can do that. I'm talking about Bible study today. Um, God did not intend for us all to be martyrs. That was not his goal. Sometimes when you read voices of the martyrs and you read, you read about the, the early Christians and the things that they fought for, uh, against, and you think, wow, best, best way to live your life is on a cross. No, a living sacrifice is what God was wanting you to be. So, I don't know if you're following what I'm saying here. I'm just trying to set up what I'm going to get to. I want, you to, I want you to think with me for a little bit. What is right about life? We fight for life, liberty, and what? The pursuit of happiness, right? So how do you balance as a Christian young person, as a Christian person, how do you balance pursuit of happiness, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness with Forsake everything. Give it all up for God. How do you balance that? For some of us, giving it all up for God is really easy. <laughs> Just take the suitcase and hand it to Him, right? Um, and, and, and really, someone without, without any ambition, somebody without any um, interest in... in um, Wealth of any kind. I mean, it's easy for you to say, well, I have no interest in money. I don't, I don't care about it. Just, just have my little thing, my little corner of the world. But is that what God expects of every Christian? I mean, how would the gospel, how is the gospel propagated around the world? It takes money to do it, doesn't it? Do you hear about the guy, um, the televangelist right now that's trying to raise money for a jet airplane? Do you guys hear about that? And I think it's his fifth one or fourth or fifth airplane. And he's saying, you know, if the Apostle Paul lived today, he'd have one of these. <sighs> Come on. <laughs> Seriously. But is it wrong for, for a businessman, a Christian businessman, to have a jet airplane? Is it wrong? You say, well, that's just, well, by whose standards? Some of you guys, some of you older folks have probably wrestled with this and settled it long ago. Okay. But I want to talk to the young people because when you're looking at your future, you're trying to say, okay, what is my future? When, when, I, was a, when I was a teenage boy, uh, they called our church just for fun the Rabbit Baptist Church. Why was it the Rabbit Baptist Church? Not because everybody had a bunch of kids. It wasn't that. It was because in the parking lot, there was a bunch of VW rabbits. You see, we had this guy in our church that knew how to buy rabbits for a hundred bucks, fix them up, and sell them for two hundred dollars. Everybody bought one. We all had a rabbit. Uh, everybody had a rabbit. Uh, and and so when I was a, I was a teenager looking at this, uh, you know, my life is going to be we're going to drive little rabbits and we're going to we're going to all be poor and. 
I, I remember one particular person in the church had a station wagon. And God bless you if this is your situation, but um, the station wagon was rusted right through the floor. And kids would, they would haul kids to church and to school. And there's lots of stories of shoes being lost through the floor. And you think, okay, is this what, is this what young people should expect? out of the Christian life? Is that what they should expect? And if, if not, then how do you balance that with the love of money is the root of all evil. If you covet after it, you'll fall into hurtful snares. Are you with me so far? Do you get what I'm looking at here? Well, what I want to give you tonight is something I found in Matthew that kind of helps you navigate that, kind of helps you bring balance to your life, Okay? So we're going we're gonna to hit these three little bullet points here and uh, then let you go to the house. Here, Matthew chapter 6, it says here, uh, lay, uh, verse 20, but lay up for your treasures, um, verse 19, I'm sorry, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Can I say to you, that the key to the whole thing is where is your heart? Where is your heart? There it is. <laughs> Wayne's got his figured out. <laughs> Where's your heart? Um, how do you navigate life? How do you become a successful Christian business person or a successful Christian worker how do you do that and still be a good solid bible believing christian how do you do that here's the thing first thing i want you to see is found in verse 22 the light of the body is the eye if therefore then i be single thy whole body shall be full of light but if thine eye be evil thy whole body shall be full of darkness if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness how great is that darkness can i can I tell you, we're talking about a single eye here. What's that mean? It's talking about your focus and your goal. One of the things you need to do as a young person, as, a, as an older person, is you need to constantly reevaluate your goals. As you get older and you retire, your goal is it to sit in an armchair and watch TV and drink sweet tea. And it's John Wayne, right? Is that your goal? I mean, is that what you're going to do with your life? Is that what you want to accomplish? Is that it? Are you done? Uh, when it comes to um, uh, being a young person, what is your goal? What do you want to accomplish with life? When I was 16 years old, I'm not going to tell you all about um, what I wrote, but I remember writing a letter to myself. Somebody had challenged me to do this. Write a letter to myself and set out for my, myself life goals. I don't know if anybody's done that. But anyone else has done that. But uh, it was a big deal when I was younger. And a lot of people were talking about it. I remember writing that down, putting it in my wallet. And I carried it for years. I mean, 10, 15 years. I carried that around in my wallet. I pull it out and look at it. And you know, I noticed something. Because I prayed over it and asked God to guide me. You, would you believe there are still some things in that letter that I wrote to myself that I'm still aiming at? Haven't reached it yet. Some stuff I'm still working towards. You know, um... When I, uh, when I think about pastoring a church or, or, you know, growing a church, growing or ministering or anything like that, I always go back and think about, okay, what is my goal? What's my aim? If I've got an aim to be the pastor of the largest church in North America, well, I'm in the wrong town to do that. Okay, that's not the goal. So we don't try to make this church the biggest church in North America. We don't use all the techniques that they use to try to build a big church because it ain't going to happen. This is not going to be a 15,000 member church. Never will be. If that's your goal, you're going to get messed up. What is your goal as a Christian? Is it to, to have a secure future? I think you should take care of your family. Hello? Shouldn't you not take care of your family? The Bible says if you don't take care of your family, you're worse than an infidel. Does it not say that? So, you young person, you're thinking about life. You want to plan to take care of your family. Think about this. The Bible talks about a man that 
that prepares the field before he prepares his house. Do you know what that basically means? It means that you've got to get an income rolling in before you spend all your money on soft living. Get your income. So, so you guys that are thinking about someday getting married, a bunch of you here, guys, particularly the, the boys I'm talking about, four, five, six of you in here, uh, first thing you want to do is make sure you've got a good, solid income that can take care of a family. And you get that rolling in. And you get your money packed away in a savings account. Because that's important. You spend it all right now. You waste it all right now. When you, when you find that person you want to marry and you decide you're going to live on love, God bless you, but love doesn't taste very good and you starve on it some days. Hmm? You need to take care of your family. No question about that. But is your goal to make a lot of money and put sock money away in retirement? What is your goal? What is it? What's your goal in life? Your goal in life should be to do the will of God in your life in every way. Uh, the, the, the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Here's, here's a big phrase I keep thinking about, thought about a lot lately. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Wow, should that not be your goal? For God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Look, you want to you wanna talk about being wealthy. What did God say? If you follow me, I'll let you inherit all things. He, he owns it all. So is he against you being comfortable? I, I think he understands how to be comfortable. If he wants something, he makes it. Right? Right? Hey, he's not against you being comfortable. He's not against. But hey, if your if your eye is all wrapped up in that stuff of life, and your goal is not to please God and do the will of God, then you're going to get messed up. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. And if you get sucked into that trap, guess what? You're going to that's you know, your motivator, and you're going to do all kinds of things. They say the ends justify the means. No, they don't. The end does not justify the means. You'll cheat, you'll lie, you'll do anything to get to your goal. If your goal is to be wealthy, then you'll do anything to get to that point. But if your goal is to do the will of God and along the way be the best business person or the best worker, the best uh, contributor to society, the best politician, whatever it is you're going to do, if that's your goal, God will bless you. He'll bless you in one way or another. doesn't mean He'll bless you with wealth necessarily, but He might. Your goal should be to please God, the will of God, seeking the will of God. Um... The second thing I want you to see is that is that uh, I think you should have a single master. This is really, really important. Uh, verse 24, no man could serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. No man can serve two masters. What is your master? Think about your master. Who is the one Telling you what to do. Um, listen to me. A lot of times young people that grow up in church um, develop this thing, um, a desire to please. Lack of a better term. And so you, you want people to be happy with you. you want people, and a lot of times why kids... Um, will leave church, uh, in my opinion, this is my opinion, um, what my observations, is that a lot of times they, in their desire to please people, they find out that they can't because they're faulty and they make mistakes and they disappoint people that they respect and finally give up, throw up their hands and walk away. That happens a lot. And then we sit there in, in horror 
and point the finger and say, how come they couldn't make it? And they're like, the whole time, all there is just a normal person with weaknesses. Hello? Does that sound familiar? And, and so these young people grow up and they, they have this desire to please. They want to please. And so they get out in the world. And sometimes these kids are isolated. We, we bring them maybe in a Christian school, in a Christian home, in a Christian environment. Their, their friends, their social circles, their church, and so on. Suddenly they're thrust into the world and they look at these lost people who seem to have everything together. And they have that same desire to please them that they do to please mom and dad or whoever they've been around all their life. And suddenly now, whatever that person says or does or thinks is important, we call it peer pressure. That's the little title we put on it. But what it is, is it's just a nice, a nice kid with the desire to please everybody, wants to make everybody happy with them, and they're looking for that self-respect and looking for respect, and wow, the world just sucks them right in and eats them alive. Does that sound familiar? And I want to say to you, anchor yourself in pleasing the Lord. Anchor yourself in that. Forgive me for speaking to the young people. I'm missing preaching in chapel. Morgan. Sitting there listening so intently. She usually sits up here in chapel. And now she's not going to be in chapel anymore. Don't make me cry. Right? <laughs> yeah, I'll make her mom cry is what I'm going to do. Huh? So, so um, I, thinking about, thinking about uh, these things that... that um, these pressures that we have, I, I've, I think I might have told the kids this once in chapel. I remember graduating from high school and hanging out with some of my buddies. I remember we went over to a, a, a state park. It was great. My dad told me he would let me go this time, and I couldn't believe dad was letting me off the chain. It was unbelievable. He was letting me off the chain. We were going to go about uh, 40 minutes away, and a bunch of us guys were going to hang out and sleep in tents out of the State Park. Wow, what fun it was. So uh, I graduated from high school, was in Bible Institute, yada, yada, yada. And all the guys pulled out cigarettes and started smoking. I'm sitting there. It is eating me alive. Because I didn't want them to think I was a prude. Furthermore, they looked really cool. And we were going through the campground like we had good sense and racing our cars up and down the, the, the area that was there, you know, the roads and stuff back at the park. You remember Chain of Lakes? State Park, the hills and stuff in there? Yeah, that's where we were. And uh, riding the boats and, oh man, it was just a great, great place. You come in off the road and you go into the trees and... Man, make it as loud as you can make it. The music as loud as you can make it. The engines as loud as you can make it. And we're all tearing in there, just having a great time. And everybody but me has got a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And we go in there and the girls are all watching us. And they're all turning their heads. And they're looking at those guys that looked all tough and cool. And here's Dan in a pinto with a brown and orange stripe on it. No cigarette. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you, the pressure on a young person, you're not, you're not putting things together. It was a lot of pressure being a little vulnerable here. But it was when I was that age. It, it don't matter now, but I mean, seriously, when I was that age, it mattered a lot. Do you know, as I sat there, I looked at those guys and I, they were my friends. We grew up together. I had a choice. I could get all preachy. Or I could go with them and nobody would ever know. Of course, you know if I'd have done that, you'd never be hearing this story. Um, but I remember sitting there and one of my best friends, I pulled him over the side and I said, listen, I need to talk to you about something. I want to do what you guys are doing. I want to do that. And I don't want you to think I'm accusing you or this on you or anything like that. Listen, I said, I want with everything I've got to be just like you guys. I think you guys are really cool, okay? 
but I know that what you're doing is wrong. And I said, if I do it, I'll never be able to stand in the pulpit with a straight face and preach. I'll never be able to do it. At that point in my life, it was a turning point for me because I chose that to make God my Father's God, my God. We were off the chain, and at that point I said, okay, it's, it's, it's just me. I've got to decide what to do. I'm, I'm, I tell you that, these younger people, I, I want you guys to know, listen, those pressures come at you, and I, I, didn't, I didn't always do the right thing, honestly. I'm not saying I did. But, but, but I'm going to tell you, the only thing that kept me straight at that point was understanding who my master was. It wasn't my dad. It wasn't my mom. It wasn't their rules. It wasn't my friends. It wasn't, I wanted to please them. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be like them. But that wasn't who was my boss. That kept me out of more trouble than you can imagine because I am like a magnet to trouble. It kept me out of a lot of trouble. Understanding who your master is will help you. It will help you navigate life. Making sure that God is the only boss in your life. Can I say to you, the, the, the husbands in here, uh, you're going to find out that your family is a lot, uh, runs a lot smoother when you figure out who's the boss in the home. I'm not t- saying you are, I'm saying when you make God the boss of the home. You submit to God and it's surprising how that helps the whole family. If, you, if, if mom and dad are talking and mom becomes the boss, what's going to happen? Well, whatever she says, I'm going to do whatever she says because I don't want to make her mad. If mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. You know how that is. Uh, ladies, sometimes you, don't, you really have no idea how much trouble you can make for a guy. Maybe you do. I don't know. But, but guys who want to please you, they'd go to, they'd go to hell and back for their lady. I'd do anything they could to please you. That's just the way we were made. But guys, if you, if you decide that God's your boss... He's your master, and you do what he wants. You're going to find out if, if Mama, if you decide that God's your boss, you're going to. It's going to. It's going to gel. It's going to work right. And if you don't do that, it isn't going to work right. It's going to be oil and water. It's going to be conflict after conflict after conflict. Figure out who the boss is. Amen, right there. That's good preaching. Did I have to tell you that? No. <laughs> All right, the last thing I want to give you <laughs> is, um, is found in verse 25. Beginning with verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, that for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spend. Let me just take, let me just say, he's not saying don't look in the mirror when you walk out the door. Okay, some of us look in the mirror and walk out the door because there's nothing else, we, nothing we can do about it. Sorry, but he's not saying he's not saying he's not saying don't think about boy just whatever's in the closet. Close your eyes and put it on; it'll be fine. He's not saying that. He's talking about what you're thinking about, what you're stewing on. Remember, we talked about anxiety. Think about this: what are you anxious about? What are you worrying about? Do you think think by sitting there thinking you're going to grow two more inches? Lots of luck. 
I mean, you can get an inversion table and you can hang upside down and pray and pray and pray that God will help you grow. It's not going to work. I've, uh, I've known some uh, evangelists that have built um, bus homes. I um, had this friend uh, that built this home for his family out of a greyhound. You walk in there and, of course, he had these bunks. He built the bunks for just the right size for his boys. Well, his boys grew beyond his expectations. And so he had to cut a hole in the wall and he had a little um, hinge door. And so when, if you would walk into the bus at night um, and the kids were asleep and you'd see uh, the boys laying there and their feet stuck out over the sink because they had to open the door because the boys got too long. <laughs> that didn't come by thinking about growing. It just happened. Sometimes the dads would like you to not grow so much. <laughs> we, when we traveled, um, the, uh, we had a uh, fifth wheel. We had a slide out there in uh, the back room. There was a, there was a back, back room that slid out and had three bunks on it. And that's where the kids stayed. There was uh, two bunks and then um, a slide out drawer bed. And that's where they stayed. And it, before we, we stopped traveling... Ryan had moved out to the sofa because he was too long, couldn't fit in the drawer anymore. You know, those things are made for, you know, younger kids. Don't happen. But you know, you, know, you, you sit there and think, man, I, I wish I had darker hair. Well, you, Walmart might be able to help you. I don't know. In a box, maybe it'll happen. But, but um, you, I wish I had more hair. Well, there's laser surgery, I suppose. I wish I had, but by adding a thought, change it. Can a leopard change his spots? You can't. There's, you, you sit there and stew about the things you cannot change. Basically what he's saying here, and we're going to call this a single thought, but basically what, he, what he's saying here is, trust God. See, Jesus knows. He knows. He knows that gazelle. He made the gazelle. Have that fight or fly. He knows that when the lions come, the gazelle's ears picks up and it takes off and it's going to be fine and then it's going to go off and eat and forget all about the lions. And he knows that. But he also knows us. He knows that we want to sit in a corner and worry about tomorrow. Worry, worry, fret, stew. How am I going to? How am I going to? How am I going to? Look. Let me just help you here. If you sit down and you have too much month at the end of your money, stewing about it isn't going to shorten the month and add money to your account. Going back and looking at your bank account and looking at how the numbers don't add up, just looking at it and looking at it and looking at it and worrying and worrying and worrying, it's not going to make those numbers get bigger. Not unless you know how to cheat the system somewhere. And then we have some other conversations to have. Landon's probably the only one in here that could probably do that. Huh? Oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no. Oh, my goodness. Think about it. God's telling us to trust Him. Do you trust God? Do you trust Him with your future? Do you trust Him? Young person. You're thinking about who you're going to spend your life with. Do you trust God with that decision? Uh, God doesn't. He doesn't know what I like. Oh yeah, He does. He made you. Yeah. Well, we're just going to take whoever's available. I, I advise you not to go down that road. Whoever's available is not who you want to spend your life with. Can you trust God with that decision? Can you trust God with, with uh, uh, blessing the works of your hands? Are you saying to Him, God, I'm going to work hard, but I want your blessing in everything I do. If you do that, you're going to find success. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. For he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever 
he doeth shall prosper. You want the stuff you do to prosper? I want to tell you something. I have found this to be true, Brother Tom, my entire life. If you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he adds all the other stuff. He gives you the happiness, the contentment, the satisfaction. He gives you the peace. He gives you the everything. I've said this before, Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove. He wants you to prove something. Prove what? What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? God's will is good. So your life will be filled with good if you seek God's will. God's will will be acceptable. You're actually going to like what He wants you to do. That's what acceptable means. You will like it. And God's will will be perfect. When you look back on your life and you say, God, I gave everything to you. I did what you wanted me to do. You're going to say, wow, that was just perfect. I've thought a lot of different things. I've tried to do a lot of different things. I've wanted to do a lot of different things. And a lot of those things, the Lord's let me try them. And some of them didn't fit me very well. And then, but the things that God has called me to do, when I do them, you're like, man, that fits me like a glove. That is exactly what I want to do. Makes me happy and contented and satisfied. See what I'm saying? That's what God's will is for you. If you submit your will to God's will, you're going to find it to be perfect. If you think you know more than God, you don't. You're going to wreck your life. Um, he really wants you to have a good life. But if you get wrapped up in the cares of this life, listen to me. I was talking to somebody this week. Yesterday, today, yesterday, I can't remember. The conversation about the baseball craze in our, in our community here came up. Maybe it was today. We were talking about how that um, baseball season, some people just don't go to church. It's not just baseball. It's pick a sport. I don't care what it is. It, I, it doesn't matter. I, I shouldn't pick on baseball because zero is in on certain people, and I don't want to do that. I'm not really meaning to do that. So it's basketball or uh, it, it, pick a sport, any sport. I don't care what sport it is. doesn't matter what it is. NASCAR. I don't care. Um, if you, if you um, get caught up in it, um, it pulls you away from God. Um. People want to be successful. I, I've got, I know a couple preachers that whose sons are professional baseball players. And um, in fact, one of the pitchers for the Cubs won the World Series. One of the ones last year, one of the pitchers for Cubs that was in our church in, in Indiana. His uncle was my Sunday school teacher. Taught me in Sunday school. He, and he He's a pitcher for Cubs and helped, helped them win the World Series last year. I know some people that have gotten caught up in that and are completely, that's their world. Um, I, see, I see families putting their kids out or themselves out for temporal things, just for stuff that's going to pass. And during those particular seasons, you don't see them around for God. And when the kids grow up, do they even attend church? No. Becomes nothing to them. It's not important to them. Their parents have taught them it's not important. Who 
Who's your master? Seek first the kingdom of God. Don't get caught up in the care affairs of this life. Those, those, those things of the world, if they're pulling you away from service to God, an opportunity to do something for the Lord, if that stuff pulls you away and you're like, I can't serve God because I got this over here to do. I can't serve God because it... You're losing your balance. Hello? You want to navigate life? Keep a single goal to serve God above everything. You want to navigate life? Keep a single master. One master. He's the most important. You want to navigate life properly? Stop fretting and worrying about what could happen. What might happen. Stop being anxious. Stop giving thought to all those things you're worried about. Let God take care of it. Trust God. Have a single thought in mind that God's going to take care of this. He's going to fix it. I want to tell you something. That is a peaceful place to be in. Do you know how many times I've run up against the wall and I said, I have no clue how to fix this. And watch God pull it through. Watch Him do it. I don't know how to do this stuff. I was talking to a guy today and we were discussing uh, our, our track, which we, we hope looks like next week. We're going to start laying the cement for it. Um, we were talking about that today. And he says, I need to know this, this, and this. I looked at him and said, man, I've never done this before. He said, what degree do you want on this and what do you want on that? And I'm like, he said, I need to know your elevations. I'm like, you and me both. I have no idea what you're talking about. And uh, I walked away from him not worried at all. I'm not even worried about it. So why? Well, I get it. Yeah, I'll get it for him. We, we hire, we've got an architect on it, so it's fine. We've got an engineer, an architect, and an attorney. We've got all these people that know what they're doing. So we say, how much do you want? Must you, let's see if you can beat him to the bank. If you, if you can beat him to the bank, you get your money first. Now, uh, seriously, um, how, how do you do this? I don't know. Boy, it's a great place to be in that we can trust God. It'll help us. Because when we, Zach and I committed, committed our efforts to Jesus Christ, we committed them to the Lord. We asked him to bless it and be involved in every part of it. And just to know that he's in charge. That's just great. This is great. You know, in, in every part of your life, God can get involved and make things work the way he wants. Trust him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. I hope that helped you tonight. I hope it gave you some things to chew on. I really pray to God it did. It came from my heart, and I just trust trust God to take care of it and put it in your hearts. Amen? So, that's the message for tonight. If uh, we can take our prayer.